the will of God. If you, uh, I, there's a wonderful study on acceptance of the evidence of evolution. And we came in, you know, 53rd out of 55 countries measured. Uh, we were sandwiched somewhere between El Salvador and Turkey, I think. And, of course, uh, Denmark and Iceland and Sweden were the most accepting of evolution. So, yes, the United States is extremely religious. What that means, though, of course, is different. And America has a certain brand of religiosity that's quite unique. So, for example... Um, ah, this is great stuff. I, 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 get, I wish I'd brought more copies, but I looked at, um, if you look at Christians and their voting patterns and how they answer surveys, are extremely unchristian-like. And, and let me say what I mean by that. Um, at root, I would like to think that a lot of Christianity is about the teachings of Jesus, and I realize that's usually not the case. Most people are more interested in his blood, washing them of their sins, than in, in the words he said. But uh, if you read the words he said, there's some, there's some pretty scary ones, but there's also some pretty nice ones about treating each other nicely and loving each other. And yet when you look at surveys and voting patterns of who was most likely to support the war in Iraq, it's Christ, strongly, uh, Christian Americans and the more strongly Christian Americans. Who's more likely uh, to uh, support the governmental use of tor torture? Who's more likely to uh, support uh, the death penalty? Talk about mercy. I mean, isn't that, I always thought mercy was a Christian value. So that the more secular Americans are the much more sort of moral, actually, on all these moral questions, I think, than, than the strongly religious Americans. So religiosity in America is certainly not for everybody. We, I mean, there's many, many progressive Christians, obviously, and probably some in this room. But when you look at the overall averages, uh, the, more st uh, the strongly religious Americans tend to be extremely right-wing in their politics, which is not always the case in other countries that also have high religiosity. Sorry, I kind of went on there. Okay, two in the back and then two in the front. So the first, yes, in the corner. Um, I grew up in Bulgaria, which was at the time of a secular, pretty much atheist country since we weren't allowed to go to church. Uh, and, and I always felt like it was unorganic atheism for me because okay. I was simply brought up in that country. Uh, I went back for the first time in 24 years this last summer, and I noticed that there's uh, a lot of cultural Christianity, even though people aren't reading the Bible more, yeah. they're drawn to the uh, monasteries and the churches and they have icons in their houses and so on. So I'm wondering whether you're noticing this, a similar kind of draw um, towards <coughs> cultural Christianity and other formerly atheist you societies. Bet. You bet. Thank you. Good question. And uh, thanks to the former, what was it, the king of Bulgaria who saved all the 50,000 Jews? That was really nice. Um, <laughs> no, right? Um, I just played squash this morning with a friend whose mom was a Bulgarian Jew saved uh, by King uh, Boris. Thank you. Um, so send him my, his, my best. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the question was, uh, this gentleman grew up in Bulgaria and said it was quite secular at the time, but now he's recently been back and has seen more signs of kind of cultural Christianity, Christian symbols, icons, churches sprouting up. Um, the data that, the studies that I'm familiar with have definitely shown that there was, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism, there was definitely an emergence of cultural religiosity and even uh, belief throughout the Soviet Union. Not, not as strong as some would expect, um, but that did flower and blossom. And I think, uh, to me, there's two ways to explain a rise in, of religiosity in the former Soviet Union uh, or former communist countries. One is, uh, uh, Steve Bruce talks about this a lot, religion as a source of cultural defense. We know throughout history that religion, particularly when you were occupied by a foreign entity, particularly if that foreign entity is of a different religion or ethnicity, that religion has become so welded with your own nationalism, your own sense of self. I mean, when we look at uh, Christianity for Ser Serbs, you know, Orthodox Christianity means something to Serbs, Catholicism means something to Poles because of their history, being Catholic in Ireland means something. I mean, you know, we can see wherever there's, uh, whenever nations are occupied or have been, uh, or stifled or oppressed, I think they turn to their religious symbols and edifices as, as an expression of their culture and their nation. I think that's very understandable. So there's part of that. And the second, though, is we know that uh, religiosity is correlated with, with um, levels of security and prosperity in a society. The, the correlation is so strong that when there's a lot of uh, insecurity, political insecurity, political upheaval, uh, 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 that you're going to have higher rates of religiosity. So I think in post-Soviet societies, there has been a huge 
what Dirk Hahn would call anomie. Like, what is happening? What are, now what are we doing? This just, you know, destruction of the well, this overly welfare straight, and now it's like, well, this sort of free, free you know, go for it capitalism. I think it's throwing a lot of people out of whack. So, thank you. Yes, and then we're going to get the two up here. So, yes, sir. The, the list of the 10 uh, religious states in this country, I might have not heard the whole list of I was part of it in here. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Hawaii. Indeed. I'd be happy to. <laughs> I love it. That's what I do for a living. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the question was, in my list of the uh, least religious states would be a, a more accurate way to put it. Um, why was, where does Nevada, Hawaii, Minnesota, and Wisconsin fit? Am I correct? Yes. Okay. First of all, Minnesota and Wisconsin are high up there to be sure. They just didn't make the top 10, but they certainly would make the top 20, no doubt about it. Nevada, usually it's the western states. Up until very recently, it was the west coast that always dominated these types of rankings. So Washington State, Oregon, California, Idaho even, and certainly Nevada and Hawaii. Um, and, and it's the same thing. They definitely would make the top 15. They're up there. They just, like I said, I had to make a cutoff. And sometimes these differences were between 2 and 3%. So they are still quite, uh, quite uh, up there in terms of being the less religious. And then the last question, um, again, See, now as a sociologist, I realize there are issues of confidentiality. Uh, people may not want to say, they may feel uncomfortable. So this is not the most scientific way to conduct <laughs> such a poll. Uh, there may be a bias for you to feel like you need to say you are an atheist. There may be the opposite. So this gentleman asked for a show of hands, how many people self-identify as an atheist? Raise your hand. Woo, OK. How many people self-identify at prefer agnostic? All right. And how many people prefer to self-identify as secular humanist? And how many people would like to identify as believer or person of faith? Okay, nice. Good thing you're here. And how many people would identify? Um, how many people would identify as autist? Autist? No. Okay. It's a term I tried to invent on the internet. It hasn't caught on yet. Okay. Autist. A W E. Um, it means, uh, yeah, well, I don't want to get into it. Okay, so there were two up front, and then we'll go here. So, yes, sir. Uh, this is just a comment when I compare <coughs> the lists that you gave, the least religious uh, uh, <coughs> exist in a much cooler climate than the more religious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, when, I, when I did my initial work in Scandinavia, and I oh, sorry, uh, the gentleman noticed that when he heard the list of the most secular or least religious countries, they tended to be in colder climates. And is there some kind of geographical correlation here or causation? I, I thought there might be. In fact, when I was writing my book, I had this one chapter called, you know, Why? Why is Scandinavia so secular? And I had a little section on the cold weather. And the Scandinavians read that and just laughed at me. Like, you can't be serious. Are you joking? And they made me feel so embarrassed that I could, took it out of my book. But I realized that I think to most Americans, it's a very legitimate question. Um, there may very well be something to do uh, with the cold. Now, this was my theory. I don't think the cold <coughs> keeps people from going to church because it's so cold, although that might be it. But I do think the cold, you know, after a thousand years of that kind of weather, it affects a culture somehow. It must. It affects the way people interact with each other. It affects the way people express their emotions. It affects the way people uh, are insular. And so I think that it, did, it does affect the sort of character or mentality of a culture. But I, I'm just not trained to prove that in my work. So, but I don't think it's that crazy of an idea. There's something to be said about the weather affecting society, and that may even affect predilections towards religiosity. So thank you. Yes, sir. In Utah and Salt Lake County, the legislation, the legislators are considering taxing churches for the fire protection that they provide them. Wow. Uh, my two questions. Do you think such a thing will pass? And if it does, will it spread? Wow. The question was, in Utah, particularly Salt Lake County, uh, there's a proposition being put forth to tax churches to help support the fire protection they get when they need to call the fire department. It kind of reminds me of Henrik Ibsen's play, A Ghost. Does anybody, anybody remember that one? Norwegian Henrik Ibsen. Uh, there's a wonderful play, and uh, 
and uh, they've, they've built an orphanage in this village, and the pastor, Manor, Manders, believes they should, uh, no, he, he thinks we shouldn't take insurance out on this orphanage because that would suggest we don't trust God to look out for it. Remember that? Anyway, uh, so it's funny to me that churches even need a fire department. <laughs> I'm so surprised about how that works. It reminds me of the minaret in Morocco yesterday that killed 30 people during prayers. Did you see that? So the Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, okay, so back to your question. I wanted to say that the tax that they want to uh, levy is based on 10 years' experience of the fire for that. Okay, so the fire departments there, publicly subsidized fire departments, have been providing their services to the churches, and somebody came up with the bright idea of perhaps the churches should pay for that right. service and not get it free. Do I think it will pass, was the question, and do I think if it does, that would spread? Do I think it will pass? No. <laughs> it may just be because I'm a pessimist, and I'm drinking tea today instead of coffee, but... Uh, I don't know enough about the political situation in Utah, and I don't know enough about Mormons other than what I see in the surveys, and it shows that they're just far and away the most rabidly conservative voting bloc in this country. They were the most rabidly supportive of George Bush's entire political agenda, something like 89% supporting everything he ever did in office. Uh, so I'm, I would be shocked if that proposition were to pass in the heart of Utah, but wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if it did? Um, yeah, I don't quite understand why churches obviously don't pay, t I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that churches don't pay taxes, and, and I wish that that would happen. Based, based on that, I suggested the same thing to my city council. <laughs> Excellent suggestion. Let's keep up the fight. Let's keep up the struggle. Okay, um, Steph, you're on my list, but I saw, I'm going to go here and here, and then you, Steph, because you invited me here, so, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. When we interviewed the people of Denmark, and they indicate that they, they go through all these religious uh, rituals. How did they justify it to you, even though they didn't believe what it was all about? Well, thank you for asking me that. Uh, it's a very good question. The question was when I was interviewing uh, Scandinavians and they talked about going through certain religious rituals, although they didn't believe, how did they explain this to me? Um, yes, indeed. I interviewed a lot of parents who got their kids baptized. And, and I would find out in the interview that they didn't even believe in God. They certainly didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God or was resurrected. They didn't believe that the Bible... I mean, there were no sort of Christian doctrinal beliefs or creeds other than... Other than... This was so wonderful. I mean, I never had such a wonderful... My, my love of Christianity blossomed in Scandinavia because to them a Christian meant you take care of the poor, you take care of the sick, and you're a good and decent person. That was Christianity to them. I always thought that was secular humanism. But in Scandinavia, that is Christianity, and I just loved it. So what they said was, oh, we baptized the kid because it made grandma happy. <laughs> we baptized the kid because, literally, that's what we do in Denmark. Um, we, I went through confirmation because that's just what you do. It's a lot of fun. We had a big party. Um, we, uh, we got married in the church because, well, it must be a proper Danish wedding, and a proper Danish wedding must be in the church. Um, in fact, they interviewed a pastor who had performed about 200, 250 weddings. And, he, and I said to him, how many of the people that you marry are getting married in the church because they want God's blessing? And he said, less than 2%. <laughs> um, that it's just, that's a, what a wedding is. And, and the best I can say is, is um, I think they like the life cycle rituals. They're enjoyable. It's a tradition. I mean, let me tell you, in about whatever it is, I just got the email, I'm going to be sitting around a Passover table in a month or two with about 40 relatives reading about how God saved the Jews from Egypt, and they will not be a single person at that table who believes any of this story at all. <laughs> in fact, if you push them on it, they will see how grossly, insanely immoral the story is about the killing of the genocide of Egyptian children. And yet we will all say this because it's a family holiday, it brings us together, and it's really nice. So in fact, I think, um, and we like the food. And so um, that was what I got, a sort of a respect for the traditions, a love and a joy of the traditions without the beliefs therein. And, and a lot of people can see that as hypocrisy. And if, and